Hello, STAT 200. Welcome to the Lesson 2 Full Video Lecture. This is the first of two lessons on describing data. These lecture videos do tend to get long, so I recommend that you take breaks while watching. You may want to stop occasionally to review something in the online notes or textbook, or to try some of the Wiley Plus questions. These are the learning objectives for this lesson. There are not quite as many learning objectives as Lesson 1, but still quite a few compared to what you'll see in later lessons. In this lesson, you're going to see fewer definitions, you'll start to see some calculations, and you'll see quite a few graphs. Before we begin working through these learning objectives, I want to do a quick review of some of the terms from Lesson 1 that you'll see again this week. When you're summarizing data or making a graph, you'll need to know if you're working with categorical or quantitative variables. Categorical variables have groupings with no logical order, in other words, categories, or a logical order with inconsistent differences between groups, for example, rankings. The difference between first place and second place is not necessarily the same as the difference between 10th place and 11th place. Quantitative variables, then, have numerical values with consistent intervals. In Lesson 1, we also distinguish between populations and samples. This will be important again this week because the symbols that we use to describe characteristics of populations and samples can be different. We often use Greek symbols when describing populations and Roman letters when describing samples. For example, we'll learn about means and standard deviations in this lesson. A population mean is mu. A sample mean is x bar. A population standard deviation is a lowercase sigma. And a sample standard deviation is a lowercase s. There's one last point before we move on to covering our learning objectives. In this lesson, and in some future lessons, we'll see examples involving rolling dice and randomly selecting playing cards. Unless otherwise specified, a standard die has six sides. They're numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. A standard 52-card playing deck has one of each of these cards. There are four suits. Spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. You may also see the term face card. A face card is a king, queen, or jack. Let's start now with our first learning objective. Compute and interpret a basic proportion, risk, probability, and odds. Data concerning one categorical variable can be summarized using a proportion. In a population, we use a letter P to denote a population proportion. You may also see the Greek symbol pi used. In a sample, we'll be using the symbol P hat. The formula is the same for both a population and a sample. A proportion is equal to x over n, where x is the number in the group with the trait, and n is the total number. Proportion, risk, and probability are all synonyms. They're all equal to x over n. They must be between 0 and 1. We just saw that for a proportion, we use the symbols p or p hat, depending on if we have a population or a sample. For risk, we usually write out the word risk. For a probability, we write p of the event. So for example, the probability that a baby is a boy would be p of boy, with boy written in parentheses. 
Odds are going to be different though. Odds express risk by comparing the likelihood of an event happening to the likelihood it does not happen. There are a few different ways that we can write this out. The first is to say that odds are equal to risk over one minus risk. Recall that risk and proportion are synonyms, so we could also say P over one minus P. In words, we could write this out as the number with the trait divided by the number without the trait. We can compare this to the formula that we just saw for risk. Risk was equal to the number with the trait divided by the total number. While the numerators here are identical, what's very different is the denominator. For odds, we have the number without the trait, while for risk, we have the total number. Let's look at one example of computing risk and odds. According to the CDC, 91.9% .9 of all American children aged 19 to 35 months have received their MMR vaccine. What proportion of American children aged 19 to 35 months have received their MMR vaccine? In the prompt, we're given a percentage. We can translate this to a proportion by moving that decimal place two to the left. So the proportion here would be equal to 0 0.919. What are the odds that an American child aged 19 to 35 months has received their MMR vaccine. The formula for odds we learned was P over one minus P. So we can take P up here and plug that into our formula. 0 0.919 divided by one minus 0 0.919 equals 11.346. We usually add to one at the end of this. This means that for every 11.346 children who have received their MMR vaccine, there is one child who has not. Recall that we said proportions, risk, and probabilities have to be between zero and one. This is not true for odds. Odds can be any non-negative number. Our second learning objective is to select and interpret the appropriate visual representations for one categorical variable, two categorical variables, and one quantitative variable. Here we're going to deviate a bit from the order that the topics are introduced in the online notes. In the online notes, these topics are organized in terms of variable type. So there's a section for one categorical, two categorical, and one quantitative variable. Here we're gonna follow the order given in the learning objectives. The visual representation that is appropriate for any given situation depends on the number of variables that you have. This week, we'll just see one or two categorical variables and one quantitative variable. We'll go through each of these different charts next, but this graphic provides a good summary. For one categorical variable, you can construct a frequency table, pie chart, or bar chart. For two categorical variables, a two-way table, a segment and bar chart, or a clustered bar chart. For one quantitative variable, a dot plot, a histogram, or a box plot. This week we'll just see the dot plot and histogram. Next week in lesson three, you'll be introduced to box plots. Let's start with the visual representations for one categorical variable. All three of these visual representations were made using data from a sample of World Campus STAT 200 students. Each student was asked if they would prefer beer, water, or wine. When possible, I'll show you tables and graphs that I made using Minitab Express. In the next learning objective, we'll actually go into Minitab Express to make each of these graphs. In the frequency table, we can see the counts of the number of students in the sample who selected each option, 
as well as the percent who selected each option. The last row tells us that we had an overall sample size of 500. This is a pie chart. The default in Minitab Express is to put the categories in alphabetical order. So starting at the top, alphabetically, beer comes first. So the first pie piece is beer. 17.4% of students said that they prefer beer. Next, alphabetically, is water. So the second pie piece represents the proportion of students who said water. And then alphabetically last was wine. So the third pie piece going clockwise is the proportion of students who chose wine. The default is to write the percentages outside of the pie pieces and to provide a color-coded key. You do have the ability to change some of these default settings in Minitab Express. For example, for accessibility reasons, a lot of people like to actually label the pie pieces with the name of the groups. You won't be required to change any of these settings in this course. But if you're making charts for another purpose, so another course or at work, then you might want to consider using better labels. The last graph that we have for one categorical variable is a bar chart. The default in Minitab Express is to give you the counts for each group here on the Y or the vertical axis. This is a vertical bar chart. You also have the ability in Minitab Express and most statistical softwares to change the orientation. Here we have the same data presented as a horizontal bar chart. Notice that in the bar chart, there are these gaps between the bars. This signifies that this is a categorical variable. Now we'll move on to two categorical variables. These were all made using the same data as before from World Campus Stat 200 students. We're still looking at preferred beverage, but I've added a second categorical variable of biological sex. First, we have the two-way table. This is similar to the frequency table that was used with one categorical variable, but now we have two variables, so it's a two-dimensional table. I'll usually call this a contingency table, Minitab Express will call it a cross tabulation. These are all synonyms. In this particular table, there are three levels of preferred beverage and two levels of biological sex, so we would call this a three by two table. Next, we have a segmented bar chart. This is also known as a stacked bar chart. This is one that cannot be made in Minitab Express. The chart that you see here, I made using Excel. This gives us a bar for females and a bar for males, so we can compare the number in each group who preferred each beverage. Going from the bottom up, we can see that there were more males that preferred beer than females. We can also see that overall, there were more females in our sample than there were males. It's also possible to switch the variables so we could have had three bars, one for each preferred beverage, and then those bars could have been broken down by female and male. The third graph that we have here is a clustered bar chart. This one was made in Minitab Express. The order that you enter the variables in determines how the bars are going to be clustered. Here I put in preferred beverage first and biological sex second, so we have three clusters of two. If we put in biological sex and then preferred beverage, we would have had two clusters of three. And finally, one quantitative variable. This week, we'll focus on dot plots and histograms. The beginning of lesson three, you'll be introduced to box plots. In both the dot plot and the histogram, on the horizontal axis, we have the variable that we're looking at, in this case, height in inches. If we look at the dot plot, we're given a key that each symbol represents up to two observations. This data set contained the heights of 500 students. In order to make the plot easier to interpret, instead of putting one dot for each student, it's telling us that there's one dot for every one or two students, so for every up to two observations, there's one dot. If we look at the histogram, 
It looks similar in shape to the dot plot, except now we have bars instead of dots. Note that in the histogram, the bars are touching. This is in contrast to the bar chart that we saw earlier when working with one categorical variable. The bars are touching in the histogram to signify that this is a quantitative variable. Now we'll move on to our third learning objective. Use Minitab Express to construct frequency tables, pie charts, bar charts, two-way tables, clustered bar charts, histograms, and dot plots. I'll take you to Minitab Express now to walk through one example of each. This is the same data set that was used to make the charts that we just saw in the PowerPoint presentation. I'll start with the frequency table, pie chart, and bar chart. These all use one categorical variable. We'll be using the preferred beverage variable. To start with the frequency table, I'm on a PC, so I'll go to statistics, describe, tally. The variable that I'm interested in is in column 12, preferred beverage. The default is to just give you the counts. I usually also like to look at the percents. Here we have our frequency table, which Minitab Express will call tally. One thing that is a little bit different here that we didn't see earlier is we're still given that we have a sample size of 500, but we also have this asterisk with one. That means that there's one person who did not answer this question, they left it blank. Next, we'll make the pie chart. All the graphs are going to be in the graphs tab. We have a pie chart. We have unique counts. This means that we have all of our raw data. This is in contrast to having summarized data. So for example, if you were just given a table of data. So counts of unique values is used for raw data. Preferred beverage. Okay, we have our pie chart, and underneath our pie chart, Minitab Express will also give us a frequency table with the counts and percentages by default. Next, we have our bar chart. We have counts of unique values, and we only have one categorical variable, so this will be a simple bar chart. Select preferred beverage. We have our bar chart and, again, by default, another frequency table. Next, we'll look at the two-way table and clustered bar charts that can be made in Minitab Express. Again, we'll be using the preferred beverage variable, and I'll also be adding in the biological sex variable. So we'll start with the two-way table. This one is going to be under statistics, cross-tabulation, and chi-square. You can choose which variable you want in the rows and which ones you want in the columns. I can also show you this. The default is raw data, which is what we have. Um, you could also enter in summarized data, but I don't think you'll see that until later in the course. We have raw data here. We're looking at preferred beverage and biological sex. Under the display, the default is to just give you the counts for every cell, which in this particular case might be all that we want. You could also get percentages and you can get them by row, by column, or overall. For this example though, we'll leave it blank and we'll just get a simple three by two contingency table. For clustered bar charts, we'll go back to the graphs tab. This is a bar chart. Again, we have unique counts. This time, we're going to make a clustered bar chart because we have a single categorical variable clustered by a second categorical variable. The order that you enter the variables in here matters. This particular case, I'll do preferred beverage and then biological sex. If we did it the other way around, the top and the bottom variable here would be flip-flopped. So Minitab Express will give us our clustered bar chart, and then underneath it will give us 
uh, contingency table showing the data from our bar chart. Last thing I want to look at are the histogram and dot plot. We'll be using the height in inches variable. We'll start with a histogram. This is a simple histogram because at this point we only have one quantitative variable. We want to look at height. The dot plot is going to be very similar, simple, because we only have one variable. We select height. I can also point out that under the histogram and the dot plot, instead of the frequency table now, Minitab Express will give you summary statistics. Later in this lesson, you'll see how the mean and the standard deviation were computed. By default, Minitab Express will give these to you when you construct a histogram or a dot plot. Let's go back to the PowerPoint slides now to work on the fourth learning objective. Our fourth learning objective is to compute and interpret complements, intersections, unions, and conditional probabilities given a two-way table. We'll start with a complement because the complement uses only one categorical variable. The intersections, unions, and conditional probabilities each require at least two categorical variables. These are all covered in the probability rule section of the online notes. We saw earlier that a probability can be written as P of an event. In the online notes and textbook, you'll see that when we're writing out the general formulas, we often write them in terms of events A and B. So P of A, or the probability of event A occurring, would be equal to the number in group A, divided by the total number. We also know that a probability must be between 0 and 1. The complement is the probability that the event did not occur. We usually write this as P of A with a superscript C. You could also see it written as P of A with a prime symbol. The complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of that event occurring. In other words, either the event occurs or it does not occur. If we do a bit of algebra here, we can see that what we're really saying is that the probability of the event occurring plus the probability of the event not occurring is equal to 1. Let's look at an example. When rolling a six-sided die, what is the complement of rolling an even number? A six-sided die is numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which means that there are three different even numbers here. So the probability that we roll an even number is equal to 3 over 6, which equals 0 0.5. We're looking for the complement of rolling an even number. This will equal 1 minus the probability of rolling an even number, which is 1 minus 0 0.5. This is 0 0.5. Next, we'll look at intersections. An intersection is the probability of two events occurring together. The symbol that we use to denote this is an upside down U. So the intersection of events A and B, I would write as the probability of A and B. I always like to introduce this with a Venn diagram. If we say that the first circle is event A and the second circle is event B, then the area that's covered by both circles, shaded in blue here, is the area of A and B. In this class, we'll also look at this in terms of a two-way contingency table. This is the table that we saw earlier for preferred beverage and biological sex. We can use this table to compute intersections. 
Let's say that we want to know the proportion of this sample who were females who preferred beer. I'd write this as the proportion of females and beer. We have a column of females and a row of students who preferred beer. You can see that there were 25 females who preferred beer out of a total sample size of 500. This gives us an intersection of 0 0.05. If we wanted to know the proportion of the sample who were males who preferred water, that would be the proportion who were male and preferred water. We have a column of males and a row for water. There were 124 males who preferred water out of the total 500, giving us a probability of 0 0.248. If you're given a two-way table, I think that this is the best strategy for computing an intersection. There's also a formula that you could use, though I would only use it in situations where the two-way table is not available. That equation is that the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. This last part, the probability of B given A, is a conditional probability, which we'll see in a few minutes. One last note on intersections. If P of A and B equals zero, which is what we see here in this Venn diagram, there's no overlap between events A and B, then the events are said to be disjoint. In other words, they never occur together. This Venn diagram shows a union. A union is the probability of event A or event B occurring. In math, the word or really means and or. When we look at the Venn diagram, we can see that the union also includes the intersection. A union is denoted using this symbol that looks similar to a capital letter U. So what we're seeing in this Venn diagram, I would write as the probability of event A or event B. It includes all of the area of A and all of the area of B, including the overlap between the two. This is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. It's important that you subtract the area that is A and B, otherwise this overlap here would be counted twice. We can also compute unions using a two-way table. Let's compute the probability that someone is female, or they prefer beer. So the union of female and beer. We have our female column and our beer row. Call the union of A and B is equal to P of A plus P of B minus the overlap of A and B. When we have the contingency table, though, instead of computing the probability of A and the probability of B and the probability of A and B, I like to use the counts from the table. So in this case, the number of females is 283 plus the number who prefer beer, which is 87, minus the overlap of 25 divided by the total sample size of 500. This gives us 345 
divided by 500 for a proportion of 0 0.69. We'll look at one more example. We'll find the union of male with water. So this will be the proportion of the sample who were male and or preferred water. For our male column, there were 217 plus the number who preferred water, 308, minus the overlap of the two, which is 124, over the total sample size of 500. This gives us 401 over 500 for a proportion of 0 0.8. 802. The last type of probability that we're going to look at here is a conditional probability. This is the probability of one event occurring given that it's known that a second event has occurred. This is communicated using a vertical bar, so we could write the probability of A given B. This vertical bar is read as given. Let's look at an example involving a two-way table first, then I'll show you some formulas that can also be used. Let's say that we want the probability that someone prefers beer given that they're male. Given that they're male, tells us that we're only interested in the males in this sample. We can ignore the females, and we're going to ignore the total column as well. Of the males, there were 62 who said that they prefer beer, out of a total of 217. This gives us the conditional probability of 0.286. Now, let's switch these two variables. Now we want the probability that someone is male given that they prefer beer. Given that they prefer beer tells us that we're only interested in the beer row. We can ignore water, wine, and the total. Of those who prefer beer, there were 62 males out of 87 for a conditional probability of 0 0.713. If you're given a two-way table, I think that this is the easiest way to compute a conditional probability. Note that the probability of beer given male is different from the probability of male given beer. That's because in this particular sample, males were much more likely to prefer beer than females. There are also some formulas that we could have used here. The probability of A given B is always going to be equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B we could also switch around A and B and say the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. One last quick note here. If A and B are independent events, then the probability of A will equal the probability of A given B. Independent events are events that are unrelated. In other words, if A and B are unrelated, then having information about B doesn't change how you would predict A. All of the remaining learning objectives are concerning quantitative variables. First, we'll talk about graphs. Then, the last few objectives refer to different summary statistics that we can compute. Our fifth learning objective is to identify outliers on a histogram or dot plot. 
Outliers are values within a data set that fall outside the general scope of the other observations. Outliers can be identified by looking at a dot plot or histogram. In lesson three, you'll learn about box plots, which can also be used to identify outliers. This week, we'll identify outliers by making relatively subjective judgments given a dot plot or a histogram. Next week, you'll learn a more objective approach to identifying outliers using formulas. Here we have a dot plot of best marriage age. A sample of World Campus Stat 200 students was surveyed and asked what they think is the best age to get married. It looks like most of the dots fall between about 20 and 40. Then we have one dot around 55 and two on the really high end. These three points that I've circled are all outliers because they don't fit with the rest of the distribution. Here's an example with a histogram. These are quiz scores and we can see that almost all students did very well. But then there's one point at the low end, one person scored a six. This observation is an outlier because it does not fit with the rest of the distribution. Our sixth learning objective is to interpret the shape of a distribution. We can do this using a dot plot or histogram. I'll also show you what is known as a probability distribution plot. The first distribution that we'll look at is a symmetrical distribution. This is a distribution that is similar on the right and left sides of the center. One specific type of symmetrical distribution that you'll see in this course is known as a normal distribution. This is also known as a bell-shaped distribution. The plot that is shown here is a probability distribution plot. This is a theoretical distribution, so this particular plot was not made with real data. With real-life data, we're not going to see this perfectly smooth curve, but we will see something that comes very close to this. We'll also see some skewed data sets. In a skewed distribution, the values are more spread out on one side of the center than the other. This histogram is skewed to the right. The direction of the skewness refers to the direction that the tail is being pulled. Here we have a left skewed distribution. Next, we'll compute the mean, median, mode, and standard deviation. I'll show you how to do this by hand and in Minitab Express. The mean, median, and mode are all measures of central tendency. We'll start with these first. The standard deviation is a measure of variability or spread of the data, and we'll see that next. In this lesson, you'll be asked to compute these by hand. After this week, you'll usually be using Minitab Express to perform these calculations. The mean is the most common measure of central tendency, especially when data are normally distributed or symmetrical. In layman's terms, this is the average. The symbols are different depending on whether we're working with a population or a sample. In a population, the symbol will be mu. This is a Greek letter. In a sample, we'll use the symbol x bar. The formula is the same for both. Mu or x bar are equal to the sum of all of the values divided by the number of values. The median and the mode we aren't going to use symbols for. We usually just write out the words. The median is the middle value. To find the median, we'll put all the observations in order from smallest to largest, and then we'll find the middle. If there's two values in the middle, then we would find the middle of those values or the average of the two middle values. The mode is the most frequent or the most common observation or the most common value. Let's walk through one example. 
Here we have the quiz scores of four students. First, we'll compute the mean. We have a sample, so we use the symbol x bar. This is equal to the sum of all of the observations divided by the number of observations. In this case, 10 plus 14 plus 12 plus 10 divided by 4. This equals 46 over 4, which is 11.5. To find the median, we'll start by putting the values in order from smallest to largest. The smallest score was 10, and there was two of those, then 12 and 14. The median, or the middle, is going to fall between 10 and 12, so we find the middle of 10 and 12 which is 11, so our median is 11. Finally, we'll find the mode, which is the most frequent value. In this sample, there were two students who scored 10. The other scores of 12 and 14 only occurred once, so our mode is going to be 10. One last thing to point out here with the mean, median, and mode, is how these can be related to the skewness of a distribution. In a symmetrical distribution, for example, a normal distribution like the one shown here, the mean, the median, and mode will all be equal. When a distribution is skewed, the mean will be pulled towards the tail. So for the right skewed distribution, the mean will be pulled towards the right, and it'll be the largest of these measures of central tendency. For the distribution skewed to the left, the mean is pulled to the left and will be the lowest measure of central tendency. In both cases, the median will be in the middle, and then the mode will be at the highest point. We've covered mean, median, and mode. Now we're going to cover standard deviation. The standard deviation is the most common measure of variability used with quantitative data, especially when the data are approximately normally distributed. It's roughly equal to the average difference between each observation and the mean. The formulas are slightly different for populations and samples. In a population, we use a lowercase sigma. In this course, we're not going to be computing sigma. We'll only be computing sample standard deviations, which use the symbol s. s is equal to the square root of the sum of every observation's deviation from the mean, in other words, the difference between the observation and the mean, squared, divided by n minus 1. We can break this down into smaller parts. When we're computing this by hand, we'll do it in six steps. Step one is to compute the mean. Step two is to compute all of the deviations. Deviation is the difference between that observation and the mean. And in a minute, we'll go through one example, and I'll show you how I, I set this up in a table. The third step is to square all of the deviations. Then we add all of the deviations squared. We divide by n minus 1, this will give us s squared, which is known as the variance. The last step 
is to take the square root of the variance. Let's look at one example. Here we have our four students with their quiz scores again. Earlier we computed the mean, x bar, which is equal to the sum of all the scores divided by the number of scores. Recall this was 11.5. Our second step is to compute all the deviations. This means every score minus the mean. My preference is to set this up like a table with all of the original scores, all of the scores minus the mean, and then all of the scores minus the mean squared. 10 minus 11.5 equals negative 1.5. 14 minus 11.5 is positive 2.5. 12 minus 11.5 is 0.5, and again, 10 minus 11.5 is negative 1.5. If you want to check your work here, the sum of all of the deviations, so the sum of every x minus x bar, should always equal 0. Next, we can take all of those deviations and square them. Remember that any number squared, even a negative number, has to be a positive number. Negative 1.5 squared equals positive 2.25. 2.5 squared is 6.25. 0 0.5 squared is 0 0.25. And negative 1.5 again is 2.25. Next, we add these squared deviations. 2.25 plus 6.25 plus 0 0.25 plus 2.25 equals 11. This is known as the sum of squares. Sometimes you'll see this abbreviated as SS. The next step is to divide the sum of squares by n minus 1. 11 divided by 4 minus 1 equals 3.667. This is the variance, or s squared. The last step is to find the standard deviation by taking the square root of the variance the square root of 3.667 equals 1.915. There's another example video in the online notes, as well as a written example of computing the standard deviation by hand. We make you do this by hand this week so that you get a sense of what the standard deviation really means. After this week, you'll be using Minitab Express which I'll show you how to use next. In Minitab Express, I still have the data set open that we used earlier. To compute the mean, median, mode, and standard deviation, I'll go to Statistics, Describe, Descriptive Statistics. I'm on a PC right now. If you're on a Mac, you'll go to Statistics, Summary Statistics, Descriptive Statistics. Once we get there, it should look similar for both the Mac and PC versions. We'll select the variable that we're interested in. For this example, I'll use the height variable again. Under Statistics, we have the option of selecting the descriptive statistics that we're interested in. In this case, I just want the mean, the median, the mode, and the standard deviation. I'll unselect all of the other options that I don't want. When I click OK, Minitab Express will give us a table of descriptive statistics. Our eighth learning objective is to compute and interpret percentiles and z-scores. 
There are slightly different definitions of percentiles, and different statistical softwares and textbooks may use slightly different formulas. In this course, we'll be using the definition from your textbook. A percentile is the proportion of values falling below a given value. For example, a student scored in the 85th percentile on the SIT verbal section. This means that this student scored better than 85% of other test takers. I know that the SAT sections are normally distributed, and I know that they have a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100, so I use Minitab Express to construct this plot. This shows you where this student's score lies in comparison to the overall distribution. We can see that 85% of the distribution is shaded in red. This tells us that the student scored at the 85th percentile, so they scored better than 85% of their peers. Later in the course, in Lesson 7, we'll spend more time with these types of plots. A related topic is z-scores. A z-score is the distance between an individual observation and the mean in standard deviation units. It's also known as a standardized score. In order to compute a z-score, we need to know the mean and standard deviation of the overall distribution. Then we can use these formulas. For a sample, a z-score is equal to that individual observation minus the sample mean divided by the sample standard deviation. For a population, the formula is the same, except now we're working with population parameters instead of sample statistics, so we'll be subtracting the population mean and dividing by the population standard deviation. We've seen a few normal distributions so far. One special normal distribution is this, known as the Z distribution. The Z distribution is normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. It's also known as the standard normal distribution. If you have a variable that's normally distributed, you can compute a Z score for any observation and map it on to this distribution at the bottom and then use software such as Minitab Express to find the percentile. Again, we'll do the full process in lesson seven this week, we're just going to identify distributions as being normal and compute z-scores. Let's run through a few examples of computing z-scores. In this course, we'll see a lot of examples involving SAT math and SAT verbal scores. These are normally distributed with a population mean of 500 and standard deviation of 100. Let's say that I have an SAT math score of 700. My z-score would be 700 minus the population mean of 500 divided by the standard deviation of 100. In the numerator, we essentially have the difference between my score and the mean. In this case, I scored 200 points above the mean. We divide by the standard deviation to put this in standard deviation units. My z-score here was two. This means that I scored two standard deviations above the mean. Any z-score that is positive is going to be above the mean. Let's look at another example. Let's say that I had an SAT verbal score of 450. Here, my z-score would be equal to 450 minus the mean of 500 divided by the standard deviation. I scored below the mean. So in the numerator, I have negative 50. I was 50 points below the mean divided by the standard deviation of 100 for a z-score of negative 0.5. I scored 0.5 standard deviations below the mean. We're almost at the end now. There are 10 learning objectives in this lesson and we've made it to the ninth. 
The ninth learning objective is to apply the empirical rule. The empirical rule applies to normal distributions. It states that on a normal distribution, about 68% of observations will fall within one standard deviation of the mean, about 95% will fall within two standard deviations of the mean, and about 99.7% will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. Your textbook refers to this as the 95% rule because 95% is the most commonly used interval. Again, we see that about 95% of data will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. We can apply the empirical rule to normal distributions to compute the ranges within which the middle 68, 95, and 99.7% of data should fall. Using the SAT math distribution again, which has a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100, I'll demonstrate this. The middle 68% of scores should fall within one standard deviation of the mean. So we can take the mean plus and minus one standard deviation to find the interval that contains the middle 68%. The mean was 500 plus or minus the standard deviation of 100 gives us the interval of 400 to 600. About 68% of SAT math scores should fall between 400 and 600. Next, we'll look at the middle 95% of scores. These should fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So plus and minus two standard deviations. Again, the mean was 500, plus and minus 2, standard deviations of 100, gives us 500, plus or minus 200, for an interval of 300 to 700. Finally, the middle 99.7% should fall within three standard deviations of the mean. This will be 500 plus or minus 3 times the standard deviation of 100. 500 plus or minus 300 gives us an interval of 200 to 800. We'll see a lot of the empirical rule later this semester. It'll come up again in Lesson 4 when we start to construct confidence intervals. Our last learning objective for this lesson is to interpret a five number summary. The minimum is the lowest observation. Q1 is the first quartile. A quartile is a quarter of the distribution. This is also known as the 25th percentile. The median, we've already seen. This is the middle observation. In terms of percentiles, this is the 50th percentile. Q3 is the third quartile. This is the 75th percentile. The maximum, is the highest observation. Five number summaries are used to describe some of the key features of a distribution. Using the values in a five number summary, we can also compute the range and interquartile range. The range is equal to the maximum minus the minimum. The range is heavily influenced by outliers. For that reason, we often use the inner quartile range, which is abbreviated as IQR. This is equal to the third quartile minus the first quartile. In other words, the 75th percentile 
minus the 25th percentile. This represents the middle 50% of observations. We'll see this five number summary again at the beginning of lesson three next week because it serves as the basis for the box plot. This concludes the lesson two full video lecture. In this lesson, you learned how to display and summarize data concerning one categorical variable, two categorical variables, and one quantitative variable. If you have any questions, please post them to the Lesson 2 discussion board in Canvas.